Money is a drug. And the only way to quit your addiction to it is to put yourself in a position to no longer need it. And that's why setting yourself up to retire early is the best thing you can do in your life. In fact, it's the number one thing you can do to bring happiness, peace, and excitement to your life. But it's not for the reasons you think. Most people picture early retirement as relaxing on the beach and drinking all day. But in reality, early retirement is the exact opposite. Putting yourself in a position to retire early opens you up to a whole new world where you don't have to rely on money. It's like giving yourself two rich parents that hand you a trust fund, except you actually earn this trust fund. When you don't have to rely on money anymore, you can choose to work in a job you're actually passionate about, or you can quit your job and start the business you've always wanted. You can take time off work and spend more time with family. You can take the trips and the vacations you've always dreamed of. Ultimately, it gives you the ability to live life to the fullest. And that's why I'm so passionate to retire early, but I haven't done it yet. So that's why I wanted to turn to the early retirement expert, Graham Stephan, to find all the best tips he has for helping you to retire in 20 years or less. He has been able to save over 99% of his income by living extremely frugally in the most expensive state in the country. California. And what I found was pretty simple. But anyway, one of the best ways to save as much money as you can is to move in your mom's basement and then borrow her car when she's not using it and then use your credit card to go and buy things so you don't have to pay for it yourself. Seriously, it works wonders and is one of the best ways to save as much money as you possibly can. I'm just kidding. That was a joke. While I would love to live like Dale and Brennan, I can't. And I'm assuming you can't either. So in this video, I'm going to compile the nine most important tips Graham has given in his videos to help you retire in 20 years or less, regardless of how much money you make. But before we get into Graham's tips, there's three beliefs we have to change that are holding you back from retiring early, and the third one is the most important. The first belief is, When it comes to increasing your net worth and being able to retire, contrary to popular belief, it makes no difference how much money you make. Of course, you might be thinking, But Graham, you're an idiot. Of course money matters, because if I made $10 million right now, I'd be able to retire. But what most people don't realize is that when it comes to financial independence, it only matters how much of that income you get to save at the end of the day. If person A was making $250,000 per year and had a big house and a fancy car, but wasn't saving anything, and person B was making $100,000, lived in a modest house, and had a used car, but was saving $40,000 per year, even though on the surface, person A would look like they were wealthier and had a better life, person B would actually be able to retire sooner. So at the end of the day, your income doesn't matter. What matters is how much you save as a percentage of your income. But what percentage should you be saving? That leads me to the second belief holding you back. Some people think that if you want to retire early, you can follow simple budgeting rules. The most common budgeting rule is the 50-30-20 rule. It states that you should spend no more than 50% of your income on needs like your home, car, and food. 30% of your income on wants like entertainment and travel, and 20% on savings for retirement. And while this is a great place to get started, it's not enough to help you retire early. In fact, if you save and invest 20% of your income, it will take you around 37 years to retire off your investments. Like Graham said, your ability to retire early is directly correlated to the percentage of income you can save. So the guideline he tells his subscribers to follow is one where you could save 42% of your income. And if you can do this, you can retire in 20 years or less. Meaning if you're 25 right now, you don't have to wait until you're 60, 65, or 70 to retire. You could retire at 45 years old. Now, before you think Graham is insane for suggesting you save 42% of your income, let's talk about the third belief holding you back. People think that you won't enjoy your life when you're saving money. That's not true. In 2023, I was able to save 50% of my income, and I did that by implementing these nine tips, and I promise you, I still went out with my friends, went on dates, took vacations, and enjoyed every bit of the year. When you implement them, you'll actually learn how to save money by cutting out the things that don't affect your happiness. We spend so much money on things in life that we don't actually care about because it's what everyone else is spending money on. But when you figure out what doesn't matter to you and save money in those categories, you're able to set yourself up for early retirement while still being able to enjoy your life. So without further ado, here are the tips. The first thing we have to do in order to save 42% of our income is shift from being a spender to being a saver. And that's where the first three tips come in handy. And these three tips will give you the ability to follow the six steps that come after this. There are a few things that savers do that spenders don't do. The first thing savers do is obvious. If you've ever gone on a diet, you would understand. 
When you go on a diet, you figure out how many calories you can eat in a day to achieve your goal. You then budget your calories into a certain amount of protein, carbs, and fat. You plan your meals so that by the end of the day, you've not exceeded your calorie intake and have gotten the right amounts of protein, carbs, and fat. Just like dieting, all savers do is budget. You need to know exactly where your money is going and how much money is going into and out of your account. Without it, it's kind of like you're throwing a dart blindfolded and hoping you don't poke an eye out. Plus, it's incredibly simple to do. Not poking an eye out. I meant budgeting. If you don't know where all your money's going, then you'll never know how to save it. It's as simple as taking your last month's expenses and writing them all down on a piece of paper and just reviewing it. You'll be shocked at some of the things you were spending money on that you never realized. The second thing savers do that spenders don't is something that the IRS figured out in 1935. They realized that if they would give Americans their full paycheck and then ask for the taxes at the end of the year, they were less likely to get paid the full amount they were owed. But once they started taking money out of your paycheck and giving you what was left over, they saw a large increase in tax revenue. And so if you want to become a saver, you have to start treating your savings like the IRS treats taxes. And that would be the concept of paying yourself first. This runs with the philosophy that most people first spend their money on housing, transportation, food, entertainment, life, and then they save whatever's left over. But paying yourself first flips this around entirely. With this, you'll automatically pay yourself a certain amount right off the top, and then you'll get to freely spend whatever's left over. I mean, let's face it, the average person is not trying what they make, aren't budgeting, and have no idea how much they spend, this will have the most immediate impact in terms of how much that person is able to save. When you try to pay all your bills and save what's left over at the end of the month, you typically have spent everything and have nothing left to save. But when you save your money first and then spend what's left over, you're forced to make do with the money left over in your account. You're essentially treating your savings like you treat your taxes. The third thing savers do that spenders don't is they copy what top executives do to run successful companies. The best executives on the planet have big, ambitious visions for where they see their company going. They know how to break that vision down into actionable goals and align their employees' aspirations with achieving those goals, ultimately getting them to fulfill the vision. And just like top executives, savers, breaking down your goal within a specified timeline gives you actionable steps that you could begin working towards on a smaller scale. Like, let's be real, saving $10,000 seems like a daunting task, but when you break it down to $27.40, it seems a lot more reasonable. No matter if your goal is to save $10,000 or $10 million, if you don't break down your goal into monthly or weekly targets, you won't achieve it. Okay, so now you know what it takes to be a saver. And it's time to use these three tips to implement the next six steps. And we're going to start by taking our goal of saving 42% of our income and breaking it down into actionable steps by creating a new budget. To increase our savings, we have to decrease our spending. Uh, duh. Duh. The easiest way to do this is to start where spending is the highest. Graham recommends only spending 20% of your income on your housing. In other words, if you're making $60,000 a year, you should spend no more than $1,000 a month on your housing, which might sound impossible, especially in some places like New York and California. So before you click off this video, just hear what Graham has to say. Now, the first is by doing what's called house hacking. And this is what's led me to own my home here in Los Angeles for $0 out of pocket while still getting to live here for free. And if that sounds too good to be true, let me explain how it works and how I've done it. To start, house hacking is when you buy a multifamily property like a duplex, triplex, or fourplex, then you move into one of the units and rent out the others to cover your cost. You might also be able to do this with a single family home with a guest house or be able to rent out a basement to cover your overhead. And typically when done right, the rental income from the other units should cover all of your overhead and expense of owning the building. And when that happens, essentially you got a free place to stay. Now, even Graham will admit in 2024, housing prices are astronomical and he can't find any good deals. But if you break house hacking down into its most basic form, all house hacking is, is a side hustle. And the goal of doing it is to make enough money from it that you can cover the cost of your housing payment. So even if you can't house hack right now, what is a side job you can get that'll make you enough money to pay for your mortgage or rent. After your home, your next biggest expense is most likely your car. Graham recommends spending no more than 10% of your income on your car payment. 
So if you make $60,000 a year, once again, you should be spending no more than $500 per month on your car payment. Now, regardless of where you live, this one is definitely possible to do. The way you can do this is by following exactly what Graham has to say. I've also found a really interesting way to save on transportation, and that's by paying very close attention to the car I drive, and I'm gonna call this one car hacking. And I know that sounds like super shady stuff, like car hacking, uh, it's not. I know these are fairly specific one-off examples, but there are a lot of cars out there that you could buy for under market value that have already experienced the majority of their depreciation that you could pretty much drive for free without it losing much value. For example, many used cars reach this point after about five or six years that you could buy it at a good deal and then drive it without that car costing you a lot of money. When you buy a car that's five to six years old, it'll still be just as reliable as a new car, but the price will have decreased enough to make the monthly payment much lower than if you bought it new. On top of that, because the car has experienced the biggest part of its depreciation, when you go to resell it in the future, you'll be selling it for a price that's closer to what you paid for it. After your car payment, the next most expensive thing in your budget is food. Once again, Graham recommends spending no more than 10% of your income on food. Another way that I've been able to cut back and save a decent amount of money is by not frequently eating out at restaurants. Now, I totally understand that this might not have as big of an impact on your finances like housing or transportation, but still, every little bit matters and it does add up. For me, I've been able to really easily cut back on this just by going and making food at home and then bringing it to work instead of spending 10 to $15 on lunch. Or instead of going out to eat somewhere, it's really easy to go to the grocery store, spend $7 on food, and make yourself a meal for the fraction of a price a restaurant would charge you. Now that's not to say that I never go out to restaurants because that's not the case. But even when you do go out, you can still find different ways to save money without much effort. One of the ways I could do this is just by finding restaurant happy hours, which will often give you a 10 to 50% discount just by going a little earlier or a little later. It's the exact same food at the exact same place with the exact same experience, except maybe you show up at 5.30 instead of at seven and you pay half the price. Another way to do this is is that if all of your friends are going out to a big meal but you don't feel like spending $40 on food, just go and order an appetizer instead. Usually those appetizers are just as filling, they're half the price, and you still get to enjoy a meal with all of your friends, except you're saving a lot of money. I think something as simple as meal prepping your lunches for the week is very practical. Not only will you eat healthier, but you'll save money. At the same time, it may sound a little odd to go out to dinner and just order an appetizer. I think it's most important to find what works for you and your life when it comes to this category. However, I've seen the biggest cause of overspending in this category be either eating out too much or door dashing. So those are two areas you should be focused on cutting back. After these expenses, you have to account for the little expenses like healthcare and utilities. Graham recommends you shouldn't spend more than 5% of your expenses on healthcare and 3% on your utilities and miscellaneous expenses. So through car hacking, house hacking, and eating food at home, you can decrease your biggest expenses. So to finish the rest of this budget, we have to turn to the next three tips. Americans on average spend $18,000 a year on things they don't need, and the average income in America is $60,000. So the average American is spending 30% on their wants. But Graham recommends that you should only be spending 10% on whatever you want. So how do we cut out that extra 20%? Well, we have to implement these next three tips. If you've ever made a purchase in your life that you ended up regretting, it was because you purchased it at the last minute on an impulse. So the first way to ensure you only spend 10% on this category is to decrease our impulse purchases. The first trick that I use is that if there's anything I'm looking to buy, I never buy it now and instead I buy it tomorrow. Now this one is really just about cutting down on impulse purchases that you make without ever really realizing it. And this one is especially interesting once you start digging deeper. And this is because many studies have shown that shopping actually releases dopamine in the brain that brings about a sensation of happiness and well-being. And if we go even deeper down the rabbit hole, because this is what I was doing all last night, is researching the effects of shopping on the brain. Don't ask me why I found this stuff interesting, but here we go. This is the best part about all of this, is that they found the real dopamine hit doesn't come from actually buying the item that you're going out to get. Instead, it comes from the anticipation of buying the item itself. From this, we could basically conclude that buying something won't necessarily give you that fun excitement that you're looking for. And you can get all of the same enjoyment from shopping if you just don't actually buy anything and if you just window shop instead. And that happens to save you a lot of money. So if you just wait 24 hours before buying what you want, you can decrease your impulse purchases. But this alone won't help you decrease your free spending by 20%. The best trick for decreasing how much we spend is to change the way we look at spending money. To so think to yourself, 
how many hours will I have to work to pay for it? So if you're making $20 an hour and you decide to drop $60 on dinner, in a way that dinner is costing you three hours of your time to pay for it. Or going and spending $20 on your lunch break is basically the equivalent of you working an extra hour just to pay for it. Given that, it's really vital that we spend our money on the things that are most important to us. And since our time is such a limited resource, we shouldn't waste our time working for things that don't bring us long-term value. And sometimes when you consider how long you're gonna have to work to pay for something that you might not actually use, it really makes you reconsider whether or not that thing is worth buying in the first place. Just take a few minutes to calculate how much you make an hour and start to look at all your purchases in terms of how many hours it costs to pay for it. It will give you a whole new perspective on how much money you're spending. But ultimately, when you only have 10% of your income to spend on what you want, you have to decide what's worth spending money on and what's not. And to do this, you have to look at the dollar to fund ratio. To me, financial minimalism really supports the notion that it's okay to spend money on something and enjoy yourself as long as that something brings you the equivalent amount of value as what you spend on it, and as long as you can get a better value for that spending elsewhere. Think of it almost like a dollar to fun ratio. How much enjoyment can you get out of every dollar, and where would it be its best use? Much like you would invest your money to get the best return possible, and then balancing that out with the risk it takes to get the money, the dollar to fun ratio is how much enjoyment you would get from something versus how much that something actually costs. For example, for me, I get a lot more enjoyment out of spending $100 on a fun night out with friends than buying $100 worth of clothes. So if you can follow these three tips, you can get your free spending down to 10%. And just like that, you've accounted for everything you need with 42% left to save. But remember, savers pay themselves first. So every time you get paid, make sure to flip this budget around. Save 42% first and then spend what's left over. Now that you know the mindset, the budget, and the tips it takes to save 42% of your income, you're well on your way to achieving early retirement, which is super exciting. But in order to stay consistent with this budget, you have to understand the psychology behind achieving your financial goals. And that's why I reviewed Dave Ramsey's Baby Step Formula. He's used it to help more than 6 million people with their personal finances. And I know that most people think that Dave Ramsey's success comes from paying off debt but that's not true. The secret behind Dave Ramsey's success is the secret psychological hack that relies on nature's strongest drug. So check out this video next if you wanna achieve every financial goal you set for yourself.